stay fly. And Jesus said, I of my own self can do nothing. Now that was Jesus. Jesus couldn't get it done on his own by himself in a vacuum. So what's up with you? Why would you think you could do anything significant, anything worth talking about on your own by yourself? You're listening to The Fly Guy Show. They do everything on the fly and in such a fly manner. Stay fly, stay fly, stay fly. The views expressed on The Fly Guy Podcast by the guests of The Fly Guy Podcast are only the views of the guests. Unless we say we agree. Unless explicitly stated. <laughs> hey, this is Arnie Thomas here on the Bold School Podcast. You're listening to Psycho Vaughner's Fly Guy Podcast. Support, like, subscribe, and share. He's saying some good things. Share it. Don't keep it to yourself. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of introducing to some and presenting to others Dr. George C. Frazier. <laughs> All right. Very extensive bio here. I'm going to try to get everything right. Bear with me. But I do want to make sure that we bring him up here correct way. So, Dr. George C. Frazier is chairman and CEO of Frazier Net Incorporated, a company he founded 32 years ago to lead a global networking and economic development movement for people of African descent. Born in Brooklyn, New York. Got any Brooklyn, New York? All right. He was an orphan and a foster child for 15 years. He spent 20 years in leadership positions with Procter & Gamble, United Way, and Ford Motor Company before starting his own business, Frazier Net Incorporated, and that was in 1987. He's written six best-selling books to include Success Runs in Our Race, Click, and most recently, Mission Unstoppable, Extraordinary Stories of Failure's Blessings, a book that he co-authored with Les Brown, ladies and gentlemen. Upscale Magazine named him one of the top 50 power brokers in black America and black enterprise magazine called him black America's number one networker and featured him on its cover. Dr. Frazier has been featured on seven national magazine covers. He's received over 350 awards and citations to include induction into the Minority Business Hall of Fame and Museum, three honorary doctorate degrees, a chaplaincy, and an ambassadorship. He's a certified financial education instructor and has an insurance license. He's been named as one of the best speakers in America, and five of his speeches have been selected for global distribution by the prestigious Vital Speeches of the Day magazine. That's a first for any professional speaker in America. A first for any professional speaker in America. In 2016, President Obama awarded Dr. Frazier the President's Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Frazier is most proud of the two charter schools he helped found it in Cleveland, Ohio, nearly 15 years ago, which educate nearly 300 inner city black children, of which 60% are boys. As an elder, Dr. Frazier uses his massive network and influence to launch a new virtual nation with no borders, boundaries, or barriers. It's called Frazier Nation, Citizens of Generational Wealth. The goal is to mobilize and unify people of African descent around effective networking, businesses to business development, training, and coaching. He will also join the fight for financial literacy in black America. His organization has already launched the WINS. WINS stands for Wealth Building Centers and Career... Wait, hold on. That's not what it stands for. WINS is Wealth Building Centers and Curriculum, just to let you know. Now, over the next decade, thousands of new and well-equipped faith-based WINS centers will be open and they will be free of charge to all those who want to teach and or learn the basics of wealth creation and management and over one million black people and allies will be citizens of Fraser Nation. Absolutely, that is worth a huge hand clap. Something else worth a very huge hand clap. He has been married to Nora Jean for 46 years. They have two sons 
and they have three granddaughters. And we are honored to have this keynote speaker here this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for the Dr. George C. Frazier. Are the lights off? Turn the lights off. There we go. I want to see this beautiful audience. Listen, this is called, in the speaking world, this is called a cold start. 1945, I was born in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, New York. I said Bed-Stuy. Now, they say if you're from Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn, New York, you're either a thug or a gangster. I'm a gangster. You're going to find out in a minute. But let me make one thing perfectly clear. What I have just witnessed for the last two and a half hours is gangster. Oh my God. I don't even know why I'm here. Um, oh, let me clear something up first. Yes, I am black. And in case you were not entirely sure. <laughs> we're going to do it this way. I don't, right. That's actually the beauty of our culture and race, isn't it? We come in all shapes, sizes. This is good. This is good. Here we go. Can you hear me? All right. Yes, we come in all shapes, sizes, skin tones, and hair textures, right? Lots of options out there, brothers and sisters. No need to stray. That's a gangster move from Bed Stuy. You missed your shout right there. Vasari gave my speech. Where's Vasari? There you are in my face. You gangster, man. That was beautiful. I met Vasari out here in the reception area before the party started. And I was really happy and proud that he had brought his daughter to the dinner. But that turned out to be his wife. So that's how you roll. Beautiful. Blair, where's Blair? There's Blair. There. You changed your dress? She had a red dress on with the, you know, that thing in the back. That, that was beautiful. Uh, you are the bomb.com. You really are. You are the bomb.com. I, I do a lot of speeches. I do 150, 160 speeches a year around the world. I'm just returning from two weeks in uh, Africa. And, uh, and I have to, and I'm saying this from my heart, I mean this, this, you have programmed this around the most important subject facing black people in the 21st century today, and that's wealth driven by business development. So God bless you, which was really the theme of my talk this evening, and it's like we coordinated the themes for our talk. We did not, but this is magnificent. So I got a fellow, Basari, he gave him a speech, a slamming band, jazz band, I'm a jazz buff being from New York, an awesome dinner. The salmon was slamming. Wasn't that salmon good? That salmon was good. Um, then I got to sit down front here with some some gangster young folk. I mean, check this sister's hair out. This brother's hair and these two hats over here. Man, can I have one of them when you finish with it? Right? When I grow up, I want to look like that. So this is really an honor. This is, a, I, I feel full 
Um, it is rare that I speak at a dinner so well planned and the editorial and the pitch so well tuned and fine tuned and the way you raise money with grace and elegance. It's just magnificent and I'm so proud as an elder. And I'm an elder. I'm 75 years old. I know I look 35 or 40. I look 35 or 40, right? That's because black don't crack, right? Right, JR? JR is one of our faculty members here at the uh, at the event today. He's a faculty member of the Power Networking Conference. I want to contribute something to whomever wins the pitch contest tomorrow, right? So I'd like to give them uh, a full $1,500 registration to the Power Networking Conference next June in Houston. So that's my gift. We'll just pile on stuff to the winner, okay? And uh, so, that, uh, so write me down for that and uh, call me on it, okay? No, no question about it. And for those of you who are interested, we put some information out on the conference on the table. If you're interested in the conference next year in Houston, Texas, July 8th through the 11th, it's our 19th conference. Ford, the Forbes magazine named the Power Network Conference one of the top five conferences in America not to be missed. Not one of the top five black conferences. One of the top five of all the conferences produced in this country. Right. The other thing I am so proud of is that you guys are unashamedly black. You blackity black. And, you know, you're doing this in mixed company. And ain't nobody looking at see how the white folks are reacting. I'm coming back here. I'm coming back here. This um, so in the spirit, in the spirit of the moment, Black Diamond Affair, which is really black excellence. And you know what it takes to make a diamond, right? Pressure. Years and years and years of pressure. We understand pressure. We birthed a new nation at the Power Networking Conference this year in June. Brazier Nation, Citizens of Generational Wealth, where we are deeply committed to demonstrated excellence, equity and investment, and entrepreneurial thinking. And we closed the birth of that nation. We had a lot of celebrities and a lot of muckety-mucks do wonderful talks. We showed, we had produced a video for it to help our people remember that we are all drinking from wells that we did not dig. That we are standing on the shoulders of giants. That success runs in our race. And it's not a hundred years old. It's not 400 years old. It is thousands of years old that we are the mothers and fathers of humankind, that we civilized the world. White folks flip the script on us. They say they came to Africa and civilized us. Wrong. Go to Egypt. Look at the pyramids of Giza built 5,000 years before Christ still standing. Do you think the Empire State Building will be standing 7,000 years from now? I don't think so. Egypt is in Africa, brothers and sisters, in case no one told you. It is not in the Mediterranean, which means that Africans built the pyramids. And if you go to Egypt, and I've been there three times, and you go into the Valley of the Kings and into the caves and into the pyramids, you will see scribed on the wall and painted on the wall black people of every shade in this room. So excellence, black diamonds, 
is in fact who we are. So I hadn't planned this, but it came to me as you were talking, and I went over and, and I asked the brother in Omega Sci Fi because he liked my, you know, my, my purple tie. He's a Q. I'm a Sigma. We won't hold that against him because he's getting ready to play this video for me. <laughs> I want you to see this. And I want to dedicate this to you. And I want you to remember the greatness and the success that has always run in our race. And this is just the next version, the next iteration of the excellence in the Hampton Roads area and the excellence in the black world. Don't you ever forget that. I open with a prayer. It is a simple prayer. May God grant me the words to speak your thoughts. Dear Lord, today alleviate the unnecessary, interrupt the annoying, upset the status quo, assign more angels, usher in more miracles, and overthrow everything that is average. That we cannot be average. My mama told me 50 years ago, Georgie boy, you're going to have to be twice as good to get half as much. Because if you're black and mediocre in America, you better leave. Because you're ultimately going to be marginalized in this country and you will ultimately be destroyed. We cannot afford to be mediocre. This is why I love what you're about. My brother, I love what you said. We have no choice. And you're stepping up. And I love that. John 5.30 John 5.30 A direct quote from Jesus Christ There are 800,000 words in the Bible Only 1,025 are direct quotes from Jesus Christ This is a direct quote from Jesus And Jesus said I, of my own self, can do nothing. Now that was Jesus. Jesus couldn't get it done on his own, by himself, in a vacuum. So what's up with you? Why would you think you could do anything significant, anything worth talking about, on your own, by yourself, in a vacuum? You cannot. This passage says to me that we were born to network, that we were born to collaborate, that we were born to work together in a common bond of caring and sharing. Now let me say the next thing and still be loved. The future of black people is not dependent upon how white treat people treat black people. The future of black people is dependent upon how black people treat black people. Let me say that another way. God has given us every single thing we need to succeed. We have every single thing we need to succeed except each other. Jews have each other. East Indians have each other. Arabs have each other. Asians have each other. We don't have each other. As I said earlier, we are all drinking from wells that we did not dig. The question then becomes for us, are we worthy of that legacy? Thousands 
years of years of suffering, pain, and excellence. Are we worthy of that legacy? Then the next question is, if in fact we feel worthy of that legacy, what then will be our legacy? What will our children's 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 children be saying about us 150 years from now? Will they be saying what was reported in the front, on the front pages of USA Today not long ago? I hope you saw this article. It was below the fold, but it was on the front page about African American baby boomers. And here's what it said. That African American baby boomers will be the first generation of Africans in America to raise another generation of Africans in America that will not do better than them. So in the 400 year history of our people in this country, we are the only generation to raise another generation that will be worse off. We need our behinds kicked. Count me out of that. I will not contribute to that legacy, and neither must you. The time has come. Sixty years ago, J. Edgar Hoover was asked a question at a conference. The question was, Mr. Hoover, the former director of the FBI for how many knows, God knows how many years. Mr. Hoover, what is the most pressing problem in the United States of America today? That was the question. He gave a two-word answer. Look it up. The answer was Negro unity. That was his answer. He felt that if black people ever unified, ever got their sh together, that would present a really, really tough problem for America. I agree with him. He was absolutely prescient in that remark and a thousand percent right. They know it. We know it. It has become very public on social media today to hear them say they fear black people. Oh, hell to the yes. You're exactly right. You should be afraid. Very afraid. Because when we get our stuff together, the Bible tells us the first shall be last, but the last shall be first. When we get our stuff together, when we link together in a common bond of caring and sharing, when we connect the dots to leverage more effectively our collective resources and intellectual capital, We will demonstrate to ourselves and to the world that we are a force to be reckoned with. Let me say the next thing and still be loved. I mean no offense, I'm just telling the truth as an elder. Having spent nearly 50 years serving our people, 2,000 speeches, eight and a half million frequent flyer miles, and six best-selling books, I am a race man. That's what I am. And a race man or a race woman is someone that has committed their time, talent, and treasure back into the investment of his own people first. I didn't say only, I just said first. So here's what I've learned in my 75 years. Straight no chasing. White people will not be saving black people. In fact, white people are not even thinking about black people. Do you know who white people are thinking about? White people! They're thinking about their husbands, their wives, their communities, their businesses, their schools, and their neighborhoods first 
They ain't thinking about you. They don't get up in the morning and get around the breakfast table or the conference table and say, what will we be doing for black people today? Asians ain't thinking about you. They thinking about Asians. The only time they're thinking about you is when they're selling you Chinese food in an urban neighborhood. In fact, if you go into a Chinese restaurant and there are four brothers waiting on you, leave. That's not a real Chinese restaurant because Asians don't employ black people. They employ Asian people. And you can't hate on them for that because that's what we ought to be doing. Recently, I wrote an editorial piece. I have not committed it to memory. It is short. I'm going to read it to you. I believe that African Americans are at a pivotal point in history. The world is not waiting for us to wake up to our power. It is time for African Americans to take a seat at the table, not only in America, but also in the global economy. Unfortunately, we continue to place our power in the hands of those that have historically oppressed us, and even worse, we continue to oppress each other. This is the meaning of internalized oppression, to continue to fall into the cultural hypnosis of thinking that white America controls our lives is a true abdication of our personal power. Marcus Garvey, the great Marcus Garvey said, and I quote, God and nature first made us what we are and then out of our own created genius, we make ourselves what we want to be. Follow always that great law. Let the sky and God be our limit and eternity be our measurement. End of quote. Mark Scott. The reality, brothers and sisters, is that each and every day is an opportunity to create a new and powerful story in our culture. And unless we find a way to write this new story and to claim our power, there will be devastating implications for our community and for the world. In other words, there is no one to save us but us. Wherever black people are going in the 21st century, it will be because black people will take them there. It was Frederick Douglass who said, this is deep, I prayed for 20 years, but received no answer until I prayed with my legs. Frederick Douglass. The fantastic news is that as people of African descent, we possess enormous untapped creativity and potential as individuals and as a collective network. W.E.B. Du Bois said, and I quote, a little less complaint and whining and a little more dogged work and striving would do us more credit than a thousand civil rights bills. End of quote. W.E.B. Du Bois worked his entire life for civil rights bills. He finally moved out of America to Ghana, where he has died, where he died and was buried in a massive memorial to W.E.B. Du Bois. He gave up on America. Malcolm said, Nobody can give you freedom. Nobody can give you equality or justice or anything. If you are a man, you take it. Yes, Malcolm, that is right. Therefore, once we fully tap into what makes us tick, what unleashes performance in our culture, only then will we assume our rightful place on the global stage. It is nation building time. We are no longer in the age of persuasion. We are now in the age of mobilization and unification. And that's what you're talking about. Let me repeat that for you. We are no longer in the age of persuasion. I'm not going to spend 10 minutes of my life trying to convince you I'm right. 
We are now in the age of mobilization and unification. Dr. King said, take the first step in faith. You don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. This is why we created Fraser Nation. Yes, we are a massive network. We are the largest black network in this country. 1.2 million top black professionals, business owners, and community leaders are in our digital platform. It is a membership-based, or has been for 32 years, a membership-based organization. Well, we're trashing that. Now we will be a citizenship-based nation and it will be global. No barriers, no borders, no boundaries. We are going to use technology, which is really in its infancy stage, if you think about it, 20 years old. The Model T, there were three versions of the Model T over a 20-year period of time. We're in the Model T stage of the internet. What will this look like 50 years from now? Don't tell me we cannot build a global nation using technology. That's where we're going, and that's what we're going to do. To be black and beautiful means nothing in this world unless you are black and powerful. We cannot be black and proud and niggas too. White folks are planning for three generations and we're planning for Saturday night. All the statistics, it was up there on that screen, all the statistics say that if nothing changes in the African-American community, by 2053, we will have zero wealth in America. In effect, brothers and sisters, we will have effectively worked our way into a second slavery. Try to operate in a market-based economy and a democratic capitalistic society without no money. How would that work? Economics must become the new black power. Economics must become the new black power. The goal, brothers and sisters, is to win, not to look like we're winning. I would rather, yeah, yeah, I would rather carry a plastic bag with $5,000 in it than to carry a $5,000 Louis Vuitton bag with $100 in it. That's looking like you're winning. You ain't winning. Louis is winning. Nike is winning. Gucci is winning. But your black ass ain't winning. The only reason you don't know your who your great 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 grandfather is is because he didn't leave you nothing but if your great 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 grandfather like the Rockefellers or the Carnegie's that left you something you would have a painting the size of that screen on your kitchen wall now we understand why our great 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 grandparents couldn't leave us anything We understand that. We're not hating on them. We understand the circumstances on which they grew up. But we cannot allow that to happen again. Because at the moment, we are operating outside of our own spiritual teachings. Proverbs 13, 22 tells us what? That a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Well, we ain't doing that. So we are the most morally grounded and spiritually rooted people in this country and we are operating outside of our own spiritual
spiritual teaching. The great Dr. Amos Wilson, Google him. Go on YouTube. Watch everything this brother said before he died. He said many important things. Two of those things was our refusal as black people to confront the issue of money and wealth is going to end up with our very lives being threatened as people on this earth. He said that 50 years ago. He also said, only when you look at yourself as a nation can you change things. Amos Wilson. Twenty fifty-three. Institute of Policy Studies. Nobody read that report. That report came out in April of 2017. And I've been reporting and speaking on that report for a couple of years. Only in the last two or three months has that statistic become popular. That came out in April of 2017, except we didn't read it. A massive study, basically, on the state, the economic state of black America with projections. Now, one of the things you got to love about black white people is they can count. They're into data analytics. And because we are the consumption class and they are the merchant class, they make stuff and we buy stuff. They have all the data they need from us. So they compute this data, they analyze it, and then they make projections. And there was their projection was by 2053, just 10 years after the country is projected to become majority non-white, this is out of the report, in case you didn't read it, black median families will own zero wealth if current trends continue. End of report. So they took that like a stick of dynamite, threw it into the community, but because we don't read, nobody read it, and said, y'all deal with it. Now let me give you a little bit of analysis. That was the second shot across the bow. Y'all missed the first shot. 1964. President Lyndon Baines Johnson asked Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan to do a study on a disturbing trend in black America. The trend was our out of wedlock birth rate in 1964 was 25% and white folks it was 5%. So ours was five times higher than theirs. And so like white folks do, they studied it and came out with the Moynihan Report, 1965. The, it was called the Moynihan Report, The Negro Family, A Case for National Action. The report comes out. Black people read the report. They call it racist. Wrong. They got angry. They picketed. They shook their fists and did nothing. Here's what the report said. Unless it said two things. A, I'm paraphrasing. We cannot legislate how black people screw. In other words, the government cannot control your mating habits. They made that clear in the report. Number two, if something doesn't change in the black community, 
Within 40 years, your out of wedlock birth rate will be in the 70s. That will then be the cornerstone for the destruction of the black family and send you back into slavery. Oh? We said, that's not possible. What happened? That happened! Out of wedlock birth rate in black America, 72%, 60% of our children are raised by a single parent. We have the worst family situation of any culture in this country. That was the first shot across the bow. We didn't listen. Now the second shot said, okay, do your thing. But here's the next statistic. Keep doing your thing. You're going to be out of money. Your family structure is not what it needs to be. And you're spending more than you're earning. It's on us. Last summer, Kanye West said, black folks chose slavery. Well, the Negro was wrong. We did not. And he was thoroughly criticized for that. Now we have a new choice. We can choose to do something about this, or we can choose slavery, because that's the prediction. So will our children's children's children children 150 years from now be saying we chose slavery? I pray not. Why is wealth important, Dr. Fraser? I'm going to say this once. I'm not going to say it ever again to you. Not so that we can buy more stuff. We don't need any more stuff. In fact, we're the only culture in the history of humankind that put political empowerment before economic empowerment. Last year, we elected over 9,000 black public officials, and we're still at the bottom of the educational and economic heap. What does that mean? It means that you cannot do it by politics alone. But again, we're no fools. We were born at night, but not last night. We didn't come down here with the last drop of rain. We do understand that we're all impacted by public policy and we're all impacted by the politics of inclusion. So yes, we must manage our vote in such a way that we empower those who empower us. If there's not an economic plank in their platform, get them out of there. That affects us. That's on you. That's on us. We're in control of that. Why is wealth important? Your wealth will determine where you live. Where you live will determine where your children go to school. Where your children go to school will determine the quality of your children's higher education. And the quality of your children's higher education will determine their lifelong earnings. And your children's lifelong earnings will determine where your children live. And where your children live will determine where your grandchildren go to school. And where your grandchildren go to school will determine the quality of their higher education and their lifelong earning. Do you see the spiral and the cycle of poverty there? Dr. Fraser, why is wealth important? Because in a, mar in a market-based economy and a democratic capitalistic society, the only color that really matters is green, baby! Green, put nine zeros next to your name and see how much your color matters. I said nine zeros, Robert Smith, who can pay the, for the college education of 400 students at Morehouse. He got nine zeros next to his name, Brown Brother. Harvard just asked him to be on the board. I wonder why. They want him on the board of the, the Museum of Modern Art and the New York Philharmonic. He's a Brown brother with nine zeros next to his name. 
Why is wealth important, Dr. Fraser? Because when we finish pontificating ad nauseum about our issues, somebody's got to write a check. Our Jewish brothers and sisters can write a check. Our Asian brothers and sisters can write a check. I just recently returned, about a year ago really, uh, from Dubai. They can write a stupid check. We can't write a check. We can hardly convene as a people without somebody else writing the check. I've spoken at seven national NAACP conferences, urban league conferences, Congressional Black Caucus, National Black MBA. Yeah, they ain't writing that check. Now, when somebody else writes the check, the golden rule applies. You know what that is? Those with the goal rule. So if they don't like your agenda and they don't like what you're saying, you will not be getting a check. We have work to do. The idea that the black community can exercise effective power, political or otherwise, without simultaneously exercising economic power is a fantasy. Capitalism without capital is just ism. When we look at the world today, we will see that powerful nations of powerful people are producing people, not just consuming people. As I've often said in my many speeches around the world, you cannot consume yourself into equality and you cannot consume yourself into power. And those people who depend upon consumption will see as they consume the products of others and do not produce for themselves will ultimately be consumed by others. Therefore, in the 21st century, we must become a community of owners and savers instead of a community of consumers and renters. We have it ass backwards. At our conference, we spend 96 hours, four intense days from six in the morning to 12 midnight on three subjects only. Business and money. And the ancillary subject, this is deep, is wellness. Psychological wellness and physical wellness because they're related. We are still deeply wounded people. Read anything Dr. Francis Cress Welsing wrote before she died. We have to fix our minds. Garvey said it in the 20s and 30s. It was true then, and it is true today. On the economic side, we focus on the four pillars for the intergenerational transfer of wealth. There are four pillars for the intergenerational transfer of wealth. I bet you can't guess one of them. There are four. This is not complicated. Don't make it complicated. This is not rocket science. What are the four pillars of the intergenerational transfer of wealth? First is the proper management of accumulated wealth. So we can stop reading about athletes and entertainers who make $100 million in their career. By the time they retire within five years, they're either in broke or in bankruptcy. That's the improper management of accumulated wealth. There are 35,000 black millionaires in America. There are 2.2 million black households worth $400,000 or more, most of that tied up in real estate. Are they properly managing that wealth? The answer would be hell to the no or we wouldn't be having this conversation. Now, don't get excited about the 35,000 black millionaires. There are 1.5 million white millionaires. The proper management of accumulated wealth. I could go deep on that. We're, 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 we're running out of time. The second is real estate. 
What's the first thing God gave Adam? Real estate. What's the first thing God gave Isaac? Real estate. Real estate. Real estate. Real estate. They ain't making any more. We came over here on the Mayflower, and we own the fewest number of homes per capita of any cultural group in this country. And we came over here on the Mayflower. Real estate. Real estate. Real estate. Real estate. I earned my first million dollars at less than 30 years old in real estate. I own eight, two, and three family homes in the hood that I treated like my own home. This was in the 70s. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying real estate. What is the third? You're discussing it. Business ownership. In America, two things are happening. Somebody is buying and somebody is selling. Right now, we're doing all the damn buying. Stop it. Sell something. If you bake cookies, put them in a box and sell it to somebody. If you live on a farm, take the manure, put it in a bag, put your name on it. You can become an entree manure, okay? Stop doing all the damn buying and sell something in this country. You can sell anything. What's wrong with us? We don't even like selling. Did you know that black people don't like selling? That's how whack we are. We got to fix that. You're doing it. Business ownership. And the final one, you, you wouldn't guess. You probably would have guessed those others. Proper insurance. The 60% of all wealth is transferred in this country through strategic and tactical placement of proper insurance. A major article in the Sunday New York Times, by the way, if you don't read anything, uh, anything during the week or anything during the month, read the Sunday New York Times at least one Sunday a month. You'll get a real education. But in the Sunday New York Times about black people and their cell phones. You know what they said about black people and their cell phones? That more black people have insurance on their cell phones than on their lives and the lives of their children by a factor of 10. So we value our cell phones more than we value our lives and the lives of our children. That's how crazy we are. I'll leave that alone. There's a form on your table if you'd like to apply for citizenship for Fraser Nation. Fill out the form and give it to me. There's a form on your, if you'd like to come to the Power Networking Conference, we're going to reduce the price for you, only for those of you who are in this room, from $1,500. If you met one person that could change the trajectory of your life, would that be worth $1,500? Yes. But we're going to reduce it, so we're somewhere between Black Friday and Cyber Monday, right? So, we're going to make it $399. $3.99 and you can bring a college age student free of charge. So instead of paying a single registration at $1,500, you're going to pay one registration at $399 and you can bring a college age student. I didn't say they had to be in college, I just said they had to be college age 17 to 25. So that's two people for less money than it takes us to feed you. That's my offer. Now I'm going to close. God works in mysterious ways. God uses imperfect people. You do know that. God has given us everything we need to succeed. My favorite quote outside of the Bible is a quote by Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius was one of the five great Caesars. 
as books of philosophy or in the library. They're profound. In 160 AD, Marcus Aurelius said this, the impediment to action advances the action. What stands in your way becomes the way. I'm going to repeat that. The impediment to action advances the action. What stands in the way becomes the way. Let me say it my own way. The obstacle is the way. Where there is no obstacle, there is no way. What is the first thing God gives you uh, or does to you when he gives you an assignment that he feels like you're ready for? He puts an obstacle in your way. And your job is to find a way over, around, through, or under the obstacle. And then you get an attaboy or an atta girl. And you learn your lessons, and then God gives you a new assignment at a slightly higher level. And then what's the next thing God does? He puts an obstacle in your way. And your job is to find a way over, around, through, and under the obstacle. If in fact you don't, that's where you remain stuck until you do. But if you do find a way over, around, and through the obstacle, you get the next assignment. It was James Baldwin who said it beautifully and more simply. James Baldwin said, we are born, we suffer, we die. We are born, we suffer, we die. What did he mean by that? It is how we manage our suffering, how we manage getting over and around and through and under our obstacles is what will determine our lives. An obstacle is when you hit a wall. I've hit many of them. I have failed my way to success. You are not allowed to stay in your obstacle. You either grow, change, or die. Observe everything that God has created on this earth. It is either growing or dying. There is no middle ground. Are you growing? Or are you dying? I say to my sisters out here, my advice for you tonight is if you can't build with them, don't chill with them. It ain't supposed to be free. God didn't design you that way. Make them overcome a few damn obstacles. I'm sorry. I finish with this last point. A month ago, the New England Journal of Medicine came out with a massive new study. Glory, hallelujah. Here's what the study said. It said that the most productive stage of your life is between 60 and 70. The second most productive stage of your life is between 70 and 80. This is the New England Journal of Medicine, sort of the Harvard of medical journals. The third most productive stage in your life, according to the New England Journal of Medicine, is between 50 and 60. So I'm in the most productive stage at 75, at 75. Frank Lloyd Wright, the great architect, built the Guggenheim Museum on 54th Street and 5th Avenue. I watched it when I was a kid. At 91, it was his magnum opus. At 91. And I can give you a list of 20, 30 brothers or sisters who did their greatest work between 70 and 80. What's the point? 
You ain't seen nothing yet. You're just getting ready. You're doing good work now, but you're going to do better work. You're going to do exactly what you had said you're going to do. You've already envisioned it. You're planning it. 150 year vision. That's a beautiful thing. I want you to take the hand of the person on the left and the person on the right. I'm going to finish with a prayer. It's a short prayer. This is our closing prayer. It's our ancestral recognition prayer at the Power Networking Conference. We close the conference with 1,500 of the baddest brothers and sisters on the planet every year with this single prayer. May we always remember those who have gone before us. May we be inspired by their vision and their valor. May their lives continually remind us that service is more important than success, that people are more important than possessions, that principle is more important than power. May whatever we do be shaped and molded by honesty, excellence, and commitment. May our children and our children's children carry forth with pride the nobility of the histories that are represented here and the various traditions that are represented in this room. To the creator of all of us, by whatever name we may refer to that creator, we dedicate our lives to make our world better and more beautiful. Can I get an amen? amen? That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Stay floss, 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 stay floss. The views expressed on the Fly Guy Podcast by the guests of the Fly Guy Podcast are only the views of the guests, unless we say we agree, unless explicitly stated. <laughs> Stay fly, stay fly, stay fly, stay fly, stay fly, stay fly. Stay conscious, stay fly.